So Deborah is doing already a lot of very interesting uh, research on how to make it a more circular movement within the ICT infrastructure. So how do you use, how do you build something, use something, and make sure that we, we recycle everything? Um, so that's as far as, as uh, I will go. I'll leave the word to the experts now, to Sophia and Deborah. So yeah, please guys, take it away. Thank you all, um, and, and thank you for, for asking us to speak today. Um, so myself and Deborah will share the presentation. Um, we just have a, a few slides to, to kind of discuss around. Um, and at the end, we will have a bit of time for, for questions, which we'll, we'll look at after the, the presentation. Um, I think just, just to kick off, I wanted to give some background into why we were invited to, to give this webinar and, and kind of put things in, in context. So um, the Green Grid's been around about 10 years now, and they've done some really important work focusing on, on greener data centers, um, mostly around energy efficiency. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's really great that the, the data center industry is now very much focused on minimizing data center energy usage, and, and best practice is, has really become commonplace there. But when, when you're designing and operating a data center, you're looking at ways to, to maximize your efficiency and, and to minimize your energy use. Um, but when, when you want to look at sustainability holistically, energy use and energy efficiency and, and operational energy are, are not the only elements to consider. Um, so Deborah and another colleague of mine, uh, Beth Whitehead, have done some really important research in this area. So we're going to kind of give you that, that full background and, and really explore um, where we think the industry needs to go to become, to become truly sustainable. So I think I'll, I'll hand over to Deborah and, and she can give you a bit more background on the approach, the life cycle approach. Okay, um, I think everybody is aware that um, the data center industry is comparatively new um, and that it has evolved incredibly quickly. Um, and it's understandable that the emphasis um, of sustainability in this area has been on energy consumption, whether that's for operating service and IT equipment or for cooling or whatever, um, it is uh, there's a really significant demand for energy. But as the sector grows with the introduction and development of the Internet of Things and um, processes such as blockchain, etc., our reliance on the digital economy is increasing and data center industry is going to grow to serve that uh, demand. So um, we need to think not just about energy, but um, about all the various materials and so forth that go into actually constructing data centers themselves, the building, the supply infrastructure, all the cabling, et cetera, um, and as well, uh, obviously, all the IT and data processing equipment. Um, and there's been a lot of interest in WE, which is waste, electrical, and electronic equipment, um, particularly from the consumer se uh, sector, the domestic sector, um, because a, a lot of us are slightly responsible and we don't use um, our electronic gadgets and devices until they break, we upgrade and replace them when new products come on the market. And then um, a lot of uh, smaller items get discarded and sent to landfill, which isn't very good practice. Um, so there's been a significant move to improve um, collection and reprocessing of that sort of equipment, but there isn't so much um, uh, conscious or um, definite activity for reprocessing equipment from uh, commercial sector and organizations like data centers. But we really, really do need to think about the impact of, of all these physical components in some way. Um, just a little um, point about life cycle assessment. When we are considering the impact of physical objects, we need to think about where the materials come from to make the objects in the first place, all of the energy and the processes required to make the object, the transport of the materials and finished objects to the places where they're either going to be sold or utilized, and then once the um, products are, they reach the end of their life, the transport to some kind of um, reprocessing or disposal facility. 
And we can't keep throwing things into holes in the ground, i.e. sending things to landfill. That's incredibly wasteful. It can also um, cause environmental problems with um, products and materials break down and produce emissions to air, water, and soil. But also, it's incredibly wasteful because um, we're not utilizing resources that could easily be reprocessed in some way, recycled, reused, remanufactured. So it's, it's very, very wasteful. Um, it's not so much as a life cycle as a lifeline where we take, make, use, and dispose of things. Um, and we really need to think about reusing and recycling at end of life. Now, one of the problems we've got, if we're looking at um, products, there are lots and lots of different inputs and outputs to create products and to treat them at the end of their life. And it's a bit, um, we need to uh, measure all of these impacts and compare things. It's a bit like having a meal and saying, um, which is the most uh, beneficial, which has the highest impact, apples, bananas, biscuits, or cheese, or could be a steak if you're not a vegetarian. Um, so we want to, all of these um, different food products, they all you know, nourish us in some way, but the way in which they're produced um, differs considerably. And we need to um, develop a metric that, so that we can compare all of the impacts, um, inputs and outputs and impacts of these things equally. And life cycle assessment is the methodology for doing this. It's a process that began in the 1960s initially, and it's become increasingly uh, sophisticated over time as we've collected more and more data about all the various processes. Um, and there are lots of levels of looking at um, the way that, uh, or the, the um, impacts that are produced. Um, we can look at things in considerable detail, or we can amalgamate um, results and get single, what are called single scores, so that we can get a a snapshot, um, so it becomes easier for non-experts to compare, again going back to the food analogy, apples, biscuits and steaks, you can see which has the highest overall impact. We can also identify hotspots, these are um, areas within a life cycle that have a higher impact than other areas and how then we can try to address those through, it could be um, reducing energy input or the manufacturing process or material selection. So that's just um, a little bit about life cycle assessment and that's something that um, Sophia mentioned, um, our colleague Beth Whitehead. Beth and I worked on a project for um, a few years looking at the whole life cycle assessment of data centres. We came up with some very interesting results. Well, it was really Beth who drove the project. She came up with some incredibly interesting results that um, so we will now talk about. Okay. Okay. Thanks for that, Deborah. Um, I mean, I think it's fair to say that life cycle assessment isn't a new process. It, it's yeah. done for many types of services and, and products. And yeah. There's a couple of ISO standards. Yes, that there are there, methodology. Yeah, that there are ISO standards around the methodology. There are quite a number of different approaches. It's not um, an it's not an exact um, science, um, and the results can vary according to the, the methodology that you use. Um, so the ISO stands state very clearly that you have to be absolutely transparent about the approach that you've taken um, so that the, there shouldn't be any smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. um, another point to mention briefly, I think, here is the difference between complete life cycle assessment and carbon footprinting, because there is a difference. Carbon footprinting is a useful approach um, when you're looking at sort of the impact of energy in particular. And we talk about embodied carbon in products or buildings or whatever. But that, um, when you're looking at carbon, you're really getting a, a snapshot of one uh, very particular kind of, um, well, it's obviously a gas or material, but it's, it's only one um, item. Um, life cycle assessment considers many, many more impacts. Um, so the emphasis of carbon assessment obviously is um, uh, you know, the impact on climate and so forth. But when we're looking at um, life cycle assessment, true life cycle assessment, we think about thousands of different inputs and outputs and impacts at the same time. Fortunately, as um, um, sort of designers, um, architects, etc. We can we've got access to all sorts of 
databases and software tools that will do all the calculations for us. The environmental technologists are really the people who build the sophisticated um, models. But um, it's very important with life cycle assessment um, the, the, to note the difference between that and carbon studies. Um, carbon studies give you a, um, a snapshot, but it can be it's less accurate than a full life cycle assessment. So, for instance, um, in the case of um, refrigeration equipment, for example, um, we carried out some models for someone a little while ago, and we found out that fridges, and don't forget they're rather light data centers in that their operational energy input is comparatively high. Um, the embodied impact of fridges, commercial refrigeration equipment, is in a carbon study is about 2.5% um, of that of the whole life, and the operation, the impact of operational energy is about 97.5%. So that suggests or indicates that, or to some people, is it worth thinking about the embodied impact? Actually, it is. And when we look at um, full life cycle assessment for the same product, this commercial refrigeration equipment, we find the ratio is rather different. We find it shifts, and the operational impact are equivalent to 80% of overall life cycle impact, and the embodied impacts are equivalent to 20% of overall impact. So that just highlights the difference. If you're looking at a lot more, a much broader range of inputs and outputs, et cetera, you get a rather different picture to just carbon footprinting. And it also emphasizes the need to take a much more holistic approach to data center sustainability. Okay, okay, great, thanks for that. <clears throat> I'm just going to try and move on to the next slide. <clears throat> um, we've got a summary of some, some results of the data center life cycle assessment. Um, sorry, we have them on the following slides, but just, just to summarize what life cycle assessment has, has told us about where the key impacts are for data centers. And um, we've got a, a diagram to, to highlight all the key areas. Um, obviously, energy use is, is something that we, we've talked a lot about, and uh, PUE is a very widely used metric in the industry. Um, PUE only looks at the infrastructure energy use and energy efficiency, so only the, the overheads associated with m and &E equipment, mechanical and electrical equipment, i.e. power and cooling. Um, during the operational energy use phase, obviously the, the one in PUE is, is the IT equipment, um, and we know that there's a lot we can do to optimise there, um, so around software efficiency, hardware efficiency, virtualization, etc. Um, but as, as Deb mentioned, um, there's a whole embodied phase as well. So we, we've got equipment impacts um, for the IT equipment. So you know the, the emissions associated with mining metals, um, manufacturing printed circuit boards, for example. Um, and then the same on the power and cooling plant. Um, so when we can produce a design which doesn't have refrigeration equipment, for example, um, that, that helps us reduce our environmental impacts. Um, the embodied impact of, of cooling equipment effectively. Um, research also shows that um, really the energy mix, the, the electricity that you're using during the in-use phase, but, but actually also during the, the production phase, the, the embodied phase, makes a really big difference as well. Um, and that's because um, producing electricity with fossil fuels is, is very polluting. So we really see very high impact um, in, in places where we're not using green or renewable energy. Um, so we've got the dimensions where we look at these, these key areas, so the, the equipment impact, the embodied impact, um, the energy use during the operational phase, and, and then the energy mix. Um, Deb mentioned how we, we try to simplify things down to a simple score often, because it, it allows us to weigh up different areas. And in, in this case, we are looking at points, so the uh, eco event points, um, which is a way that we can normalise the impact of, of different emission areas. And our, our unit of measurement is essentially points per kilowatt of IT per year. That's, that's what we're comparing all these emissions against. Um, to, to give a bit of context, 1,000 points is equal to the average environmental impact of a, of a European, so person, sorry, yeah, yeah. A European yeah. person. Yeah. Um, so in, in terms of how, how well are these things addressed um, at the moment, um, so energy usage um, is addressed in the European Code of Conduct for data centres. Um, and energy efficiency is the main focus there. It does mention, to a certain extent, green energy and embodied impact, but the, the main scope is around the, the operational energy use. 
Um, in, in terms of business case, I mean, it's quite clear that if you reduce your, your energy consumption, you will save money, mm. so you're, you're reducing your OPEX. Um, there, there is a certain correlation as well with if you're dematerializing, if you're using less plants, then you can potentially have a CapEx saving as well. Um, and there's a lot of companies now where um, corporate social responsibility is, is very important to them and their, their brand is very important. Um, <clears throat> and as such, they're investing in renewable energy to be seen to be doing the, the right kind of behavior, um, you know, environmental stewardship and, and on all of those issues. Um, so it, it's, it's not a key issue for everyone, but these are kind of the different areas where you can kind of make a business case for, for uh, more sustainable behavior. Okay, so, so coming now on to some of the results from, from Beth's PhD, um, where she looked at a life cycle assessment for a, a data center in the UK. Um, various assumptions put into the model, but this was a, a data center using direct air free cooling. Um, it was a three year server refresh um, using 30% um, utilization on, on the servers. Um, and with those inputs, she found that the operational impact was four times that of the embodied um, impact. Um, so operational energy, as, as we know, and as, as we suspected, is actually a very important thing to consider, and, and it's good that people are, are taking steps towards reducing it. However, um, it's four times higher than the embodied phase, but that's not to say the embodied phase is, is not important, and it's not to say that with different assumptions, with different parameters, the embodied phase can become more important. Um, so taking that base model and, and moving the facility virtually, if you like, over to Sweden, where it has a much greener energy mix, um, changing some of the other parameters, the, the results came that um, the operational impact is actually that of the embodied phase. So it, it, can, it can twist around the other way depending on, on your particular situation. Then with that now changed data center, moving it back to the UK, um, it's possible that you can, you can have the two things equal. So it, essentially we're saying that they're the same order of magnitude, your operational and your embodied impact. Um, but so far, we've really been focusing just on the operational phase. So given that the embodied impact is you know, ne nearly as important or more important in, in some cases, it's time that we, we spend some time looking at how we can reduce our, our embodied impact. And so these are some further results from, from the study. I'm, I'm not going to go into the detail of what these are, but this is really to highlight the different areas that we look at in life cycle assessment. So that there's different damage categories. And essentially, correct me if I'm wrong here, <laughs> but there's different areas of emissions that you look at and, and they're grouped into these, these different yeah. areas. And then you assign them points and then you're able to weight yeah. them just depending on, yeah. on your chosen weighting yeah. scheme. Um, so the study really shows that we, we have got these three areas where we, we're looking at the, the embodied impact. We've got the, the IT equipment, the hardware itself, the facilities, that being the, really the power and cooling equipment. And then the physical building itself. Um, and in, in fact, the result shows that between IT and facilities, the ratio was about two to one. So the, the IT hardware, I think partly because of its high number of refresh rates within the building lifetime, it, it's twice as impact, impactful as the, the power and cooling equipment. However, if you put the two of those together and compare it with the, the impact associated with the building fabric, so that the concrete, the walls, et cetera, the impact is really many hundreds of times more. So that really tells us that when we're trying to reduce our embodied impact, we, we're ignoring the building because it's really yeah. way less than half a percent of something that we, we need to consider in the, this context. So the preliminary research really shows us we need to focus on where we can make the biggest change, which is with our IT hardware and with our power and cooling equipment. Um, so some people, I'm sure, be aware of building environmental assessment methods. So schemes like BRIAM and LEED, um, they're very well established for, for other building types. Um, so you have, a, you have a checklist around different areas of, of green behavior. Um, there are adaptations for data centers, but they do not include the impact of your IT hardware or of your facilities. You know, they're, they're really looking around the building. Mm -hmm. The issue with that is that you're, you're kind of missing out the, the key areas of impact, the key areas where you can make a big change. Uh, for, for data centers. Um, so really the, the weighting and, and the priorities are not really fully addressed to those kind of methods. And, and that was a really interesting finding of the research. Yeah. So it, it's giving us an idea of, of where to focus. 
Um, so to, to give a bit more sort of background information, um, I mean, life cycle assessment for data centres has, has been talked about for a while. Um, there's a couple of green grid papers on it, um, and, and it does get mentioned in the maturity model as well. Um, I mentioned uh, corporate social responsibility earlier, and some people may have seen the, the green piece clicking green report, where it's, it's a bit of a kind of naming and shaming of, <laughs> of the big brands out there, and, and you know, letting people know um, who's using green energy, uh, you know, are people improving their behaviour? They're trying to influence it from, from that perspective. So it's, it's not necessarily um, the sort of operating cost business case. It's, it's more looking at um, behaviours and, and how people present their, their brand. Um, and some other things which may be of interest. Um, there's a European standard, 5600, which is all around data centres. Um, and there's two technical reports associated with that. So the first one is uh, technical report 99-1, which essentially takes the best practices from the code of conduct on energy efficiency and puts it into a standard format. So that, that's already published. Uh, that's available in, in English, French, and German. Um, but the, the complementary part to that is technical report 99-2, um, which really attempts to address everything which is not covered by energy efficiency. So all of these embodied impacts, which we, we talked about earlier, um, so that's a standard in, in development, and that, that's something that I'm involved in editing. Um, so we're really trying to make sure that we're, we're covering everything when it comes to data centre sustainability. Um, there's, there's also um, further interest from, from the European Commission. Uh, there's, a, there's a project that we're working on, green public procurement for data centres. And there's a, there's a link on the slide here, but you, you can register for more information about that. And again, it's, it's taking this life cycle approach and trying to help people make good procurement decisions uh, when it comes to, to data centres. And also ongoing is eco-design servers lot nine, which, which is, again, is taking a life cycle approach to, to the impact of, of servers. Um, they're embodied as well as their, their operational impact. Um, yeah, I don't know if you wanted to, at this stage, maybe talk about some of the other impacts which we, we don't normally focus on, um, particularly water, where we've yeah. some recent interesting findings. Yeah, um, I think, it's incredibly important to consider um, lots of impacts, as I mentioned before, to try to get the most accurate picture possible of um, life cycle impact from cradle to grave and cradle to cradle. Um, but one, uh, a good example of this, um, we were just um, discussing before the impact of, well, a very extreme example would be something like strontium versus something like silicon. If, um, as a human, you're exposed to one gram of uh, strontium, your life expectancy is minimal, as is uh, the that of just about everybody within a thousand miles or more. Um, whereas if you're exposed to a gram of silicon, that you'll have no impact whatsoever. So we need to think about, you know, the, the, the properties and um, things that different materials can do. One particular resource that um, is becoming more um, or more attention is being paid to it. It's um, certainly being um, sort of moved up the political agenda um, is water. And it's something that we can't do without. It's absolutely key to life. Um, so um, it's, uh, it's interesting. When, um, the results of this study that um, Sophia showed before when we were looking at moving a, uh, a data center from um, the UK to Sweden, for example, one of the reasons why um, the impact or the embodied impact um, of the data center shifts um, and the ratio of embodied to operational impact is about 50-50 is because of the availability of renewable energy. In this case, it's hydroelectricity, which is fantastic. So that's all really good. We're using a natural resource, um, you know, zero carbon, although obviously the infrastructure to generate the electricity, et cetera, has an impact itself. However, something that we do need to think about very carefully is the impact of um, the water that is used in the data center, in this instance, for cooling. Because when it's, um, when it's used in this, the cooling system, it becomes polluted in effect. And then there is a, a big issue, a big cleanup issue. Um, you can't just, or you shouldn't, just pump the wastewater into the existing river network, whatever. It has to be treated in some way. 
and all of a sudden we find there's a whole set of other impacts and in this case um, for cleaning the water system and they become incredibly significant. Um, and one of the studies that um, we just carried out fairly recently showed, um, again it was a study um, that was led by Beth, the input from Sophia, me and um, Robert Tozer who also works for operational intelligence alongside Sophia. Um, one of the studies um, we found that the um, impact of wastewater was actually far greater than that of the clean water that was going into the whole system. So all the time we need to think about the biggest picture that we possibly can and um, to think about as many resources as possible. Um, yeah. I think um, water is a really interesting one because um, with a lot of people trying to reduce their energy usage in cooling systems in, in particular. I mean, that, that's been a really massive change in, in data center design and operation over the last few years. Mm. But in order to minimize your energy usage, you're usually using more water, so you're, you're doing evaporative cooling, so you're able to eliminate or at least reduce mm. refrigeration, and you're therefore using a lot more water. So I guess the question is, what's the trade-off between electricity and water? Yeah. And, and we really found that life cycle assessment was a useful tool to be able to compare yeah. apples and pears, yeah. if you yeah. like. Um, I think what's interesting as well is, again, the Green Grid have a paper, WUE, looking at water usage effectiveness. Um, it, you, you might use more water on site, but less electricity on site to perform your cooling. But you're actually maybe using less water overall, because often in generating electricity yeah. at the power plant, if you have a steam turbine generator, you know, you're using water there yeah. as well. So you might have a local water stress, but, but overall your, your impact is less. Yeah. And it's all of these kind of questions, which when you look at it holistically, you, you start to uncover. And it, um, it's also, um, water is a good thing to consider um, when thinking about data center design, obviously what is going to be the optimum, um, either cooling or energy generation process for a particular geographical location. There's lots of water in Sweden, um, there's very little in the Middle East. So it would be crazy to think that um, you know you, you can use water cooling. Um, that is definitely not the best option in that location. Mm -hmm. Similarly, air cooling, free cooling, air cooling is not a great option. Uh, use of um, more traditional refrigeration technologies is preferable in that instance. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think again, you know, when we, we talked about considering the embodied impacts and the operational impacts, and it, it depends what that split is. Mm. I, I guess some of the kind of practical questions are, well, if I want to reduce my embodied impact, what's the impact then on my operational yeah. energy and, and vice versa? So I, I think a really good example of, of burden shift, that's, that's the term yeah. that we use, is yeah. if, if I just look at energy efficiency, I might throw away all of my existing servers, all of my existing plant, and just replace it with more efficient plant. And then, you know, well, that's good. I'm reducing my energy use. Um, it's more efficient, there's less carbon. And um, if, if I just purely look at the operational phase, you know, that, that would be your motivation. Yeah. Um, but that totally ignores any of the embodied impacts yeah. that you would have. And, and again, it's trying to see this big picture and, and understand, well, what's the trade-off? What's the right time to refresh yeah. equipment? Yeah. Um, um, I suppose a, um, a good um, uh, analogy is um, cars, um, mm -hmm. you know, is it better to drive your old banger right. that produces um, 200 grams of CO2 per uh, kilometre, mm -hmm. or um, is it better, oh, and it might even use leather fuel, or is it better to replace it with mm -hmm. a, a new, more fuel efficient model? I mean, it, you really do need to look at as bigger picture as possible mm -hmm. and because things like your annual mileage will come into um, play when you're making a decision about upgrading. And it's the same with data centers as mm -hmm. well. Sometimes it's better to use older equipment rather than upgrade. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, th I guess the complexity is that we're talking about lots of systems, lots of subsystems, yeah. and the way that you use them, the parameters, your assumptions, it, it depends, is, is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's the complexity. There's definitely no um, one answer. Mm -hmm. yeah. No one system. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think, are we, are we coming on to the questions part of the, uh, the presentation now?
Um, I think I think we have some some questions on on the chat. We yeah. hope. Yeah. Henry, have you sent us some questions through? Hi, babe. I've emailed you some questions through as agreed. Two questions so far. Okay, so shall I, shall I take the first one? So it's, um, what is Technical Report 99-2 and what will its impact be? Um, so 99-2 is part of the EN 5600 series around data centers. Um, it's a technical report because um, technical reports have a slightly different process to updating as standards. Um, so it's actually a bit quicker to get the changes through. So it's, it's a bit more flexible in its editing and it's, it's easier to keep it up to date, if you like. Um, so it, it's not prescriptive. Um, there's no sort of mandatory things in there. But I guess it's, it's for people who are interested in, you know, perhaps they're already addressing their operational energy use, their energy efficiency, and, and they want to consider this, this bigger picture and understand what is best practice around reducing embodied impact. Mm. Um, you know, but looking at total data center sustainability. Um, that is scheduled for publication next year. Um, so what, once that's available, it will be a, a best practice list and, and give people some some ideas of, of how to consider where, where to start really with, with addressing uh, sustainability. Um, the next question we have is where should a data center start with reducing embodied impacts and pursuing a more holistic approach to do sustainability? which is the, the sort of 64, never mind, $1,064 million question. Um, I think, um, again, as we've been saying, it's sort of you know, balancing embodied uh, and operational impact and also, um, I, I guess, performance as well, what is required by um, the person who uh, is running the data center. Um, there are things that I think uh, the first thing to do would be to consider refresh. Um, how often do you really need to upgrade your processing, data processing equipment, um, for example? I don't know if you have any other ideas this year. Um, I think it's interesting. I mean, we talked about the burden shift from embodied to operational, yeah. but a, a lot of practices actually improve both. So the things around um, optimizing IT, so increasing utilization, for example, um, consolidation, virtualizing, yeah. not only are you operating whatever IP service it, is it more efficiently, but you actually have less hardware as well. Yeah. So that, that's something where you kind of get two birds yeah. with one stone. And I, I guess also um, identifying zombie equipment yeah. that is just sitting doing nothing mm -hmm. and taking responsibility, finding out if there are uh, recyclers or uh, reprocessors in your area, and if not, then going online and identifying um, re recyclers and reprocessors mm -hmm. so that they will deal with your equipment. That's that's a bit of a, a sort of um, a bit of a dark area in a way because um, some equipment people will come and take it off your hands, but they're not necessarily transparent about where the equipment is sent to, and an awful lot is sent. Um, abroad for reprocessing um, and things like hard drives are ripped out and shredded and then we have a problem about how on earth you separate all the different materials from that shredding process but at least um, you know if you're not if you're not using uh, recyclers or whatever at the moment that's the starting point mm -hmm. but I think it, it comes down to what we were saying every facility is different so. yeah. I guess the first step is to understand where you are, where the opportunities are, yeah. and that that is in some, you know, it's, it's location dependent. It's, it's yeah. where you're getting your energy from. Yeah. To do with the age of your facility, yeah. what, what kind of cooling systems you have. It's, um, yeah, it's a, uh, it's not a quick answer. No, no. Um, are there are there more questions? Oh, well, here we are. Some more. Another one which I think you might not be in a position to answer. So there's another oh. one about um, waste water. So I think Debbie oh, okay. touched on that um, earlier. Um, so I think some of the research that we've, we've looked at recently, I, I know there's, um, there's sort of new data out there, so it, it kind of depends yeah. what, what your assumptions are with, with water treatment and, and what's needed. But as I understand it, the, the issue is about once um, water's been used in cooling and it's 
it's contaminated. Mm. I suppose you've got different concentrations of, of minerals and residual chemicals, etc. Et um, in order to make that good again and, and clean again for use, it involves a lot of dilution. And, and that's where we're, we're seeing a, a really much higher impact of waste water, maybe yeah. a few hundred times yeah. Yeah. on your waste water compared to... If not more. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Um, just reading this question. Uh, what are the plans of the Green Grid to include life cycle impacts into further developed GCMM? I had offered to support Christopher Garnier at the end of 2015, but the time TGG had little member support. Will you now take it up again? I have 20 years professional experience in this work, worked on key method developments at the European Commission in research, consulting, etc., and I'm still happy to bring in my expertise. Um, I, I think there were some discussions recently about the data centre material yeah. and, and taking it forward. So yeah. I, I can't speak on behalf of the Green Grid, but I think that is something which yeah, is under, likewise. It's under discussion. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and yeah, I think certainly there is starting to be more awareness now mm. in, in the area of, of sort of life cycle approach to the data centre. Yeah. So. And that there was um, there was a presentation uh, a couple of years ago, sort of um, not a white paper, but a, a preliminary document was put together by the Green 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 Grid about this. So it's definitely in the public domain and on their agenda. Mm -hmm. Are there any more questions? Oh, one more. Okay, another. Oh, that's the wastewater question. Okay. Um, any more? Henry, are there, are there any more questions coming in? Oh, uh, yeah, there should be a few more in your inbox, yes. Okay. Okay. Oh, here we go. <coughs> ah, can you expand what you mean by polluted water? Um, well, I, I suppose it's um, non, non possible <coughs> water. Non drinkable, sorry. <laughs> <coughs> it's non-drinkable water or water that would damage any kind of any living creatures it could be um it could be plants or animals it could also actually be um things that uh, accelerate the growth of plants there's something called eutrophication which um in the case of um agriculture for example um, when you are fertilizing crops, you're putting lots of um, nitrous, uh, nitrogen based substances uh, onto crops that will then run off farmland into the watercourse and um, any sort of weeds or whatever in rivers will consequently grow. Then the um, oxygen, if the weeds are covering the surface with water, it's not so much of a problem in rivers, but certainly in ponds where you haven't got moving water. The weeds will cover the surface of the water and um, any creatures living underneath that, like fish, etc., won't um, get light and um, oxygen that they need to survive. So that's another kind of water pollution. But it's, it's, um, it's um, mainly, well, just anything that doesn't, um, that makes water undrinkable or unsuitable for life. Mm -hmm. So there are quite a lot of chemicals that are used to clean up um, water, but dilution is, I'm oh, sorry, Robert. Um, oh, cooling towers, uh, sorry, yeah, chemicals in cooling towers are really, really important as well. But, um, so, I mean, I guess water quality is an issue <coughs> just to, to manage within your own cooling system. So yeah. you, you don't, you, you know, you often have biocides and corrosion yeah. and those things, yeah. just so that you, from an operational perspective, Things things stay working, yeah. Um, but then that has a an environmental impact, yeah. which is maybe not always considered. Yeah. Um. So it's it's how that's disposed of and how how it's reprocessed. Okay. Um. I think there was a specific question about one of the slides. Maybe if I just go back to that, that slide. Yeah. Can read, read the questions. So I think it, right. It's, it's just it's like there's, there's a question just asking to recap over um, scenario three. So why did the um, why did the switch to UK electricity make such a high contribution 
um, of a production stage compared to, to youth. Um, I suppose it's just understanding what, what are the steps that we've gone through here. So um, going from scenario one to two, we've, we've not only changed the location, but there's some other yeah. changes with respect to um, the IT side of things. So we've been able to, to do more with less. We've got more servers, but we're actually reducing our overall energy consumption as well. Um, and then once we, once we bring that back to the UK, um, again, it's reduced energy, it's increased servers, um, but it's, there is actually quite a big difference in the impact between Swedish and, and UK energy. Yeah. Um, um, it, I suppose another factor, um, a lot of um, electronics equipment is made in the Far East, and um, although there is great in renewable and use of renewable energy in China, there's still a hell of a lot of use of fossil fuels, coal-fired power stations, etc. Um, so if you can shift um, to renewable technologies for actually manufacturing things like printed circuit boards, chips, etc., then that will have a significant impact on the overall um, embodied impact. But they, these were some of the criteria that were considered in the um, this third hypothetical scenario for UK energy. Um, I've just seen another question come in, which is around um, cloud services. Yeah. So what difference does, does cloud services make? Um, it's quite interesting. I've seen some studies specifically looking at, you know, is it, is it greener to go to the cloud? Um, I think in, in many ways, yes, but I think it, it's important to understand why that is. Um, so if you're coming out of a, an old legacy facility with sort of legacy hardware, um, old-fashioned old refrigeration, cooling and, and things like that, and then you're you're doing a big consolidation project, you're virtualizing, you're taking it into a brand new purpose-built facility where um, the people operating it and designing it have really optimized it to be <coughs> to be green, um, to be low energy use. Um, then yes, if you're comparing um, an, an old legacy facility with something purpose-built and, and cutting edge, you will have a re reduced environmental impact. Yeah. Um, and, and again, it's, it's um, the benefits that you get from consolidating, rather than having lots of small inefficient facilities, if you yeah. put them in one optimised facility and you're able to, to put the workloads together, there's, yeah. there's, there's a lot more that you can do with, with sharing IT services yeah. in that way. But it, again, it does depend um, if you are um, transferring to a new facility, then the overall environmental impact is also, you need to consider what happens to all the kits that you're, uh, that is becoming redundant. Are you going to sell it on to um, other people to reuse, mm -hmm. or is it going to be recycled or whatever? Mm -hmm. Or um, if it's just stored, then it has no value, at least if it's just stored, um, it's not in the landfill site, decomposing and um, producing emissions, etc. It's um, in a stable condition, but it's uh, wasteful. But, but I think, though, it's, you know, cloud is not a byword for a green data centre. Nope. You could have a cloud facility which is, which is not as efficient as yeah. it could be. And I think other other facilities, enterprise facilities, can, can take a lot of the best practices and, and the things which make a cloud facility greener. Yeah, and and apply them. So it's it, it's not one and the same thing. But I think there's there's a lot of interesting practices which are used in a cloud environment, yeah. which, which can apply elsewhere. Yeah. Any more questions? Um, okay. Henry, are there any more questions coming in? Hang on, I'm just clarifying that. Give me a second, please. Uh, We've just had one through, which I'll send to you. Okay. Thank you. Oh, here we go. How would you approach the data centre sector, which are not always owners of IT equipment, to embark more closely on shared supply chain responsibility? Mm. Big question. <laughs> Any ideas? 
I mean, it makes me think of the green public procurement yeah. project that we're working on because yeah. th there's lots of different procurement scenarios, um, you know, and there's, there's lots of different types of users. Sometimes people are buying cloud services, sometimes they're buying hardware, sometimes they're building something from scratch. Um, I think it's maybe identifying who are the right stakeholders and, and, and asking the questions at, at the right at the right time. I think um, it's something at the moment it might be um, difficult to do this, but um, in the future it's going to, you know, just as um, uh, construction companies, for example, are now, um, they publish their corporate social responsibility. There are very definite um, moves and evidence to improve and clean up the supply chain. Um, there are um, um, not guide, not policy yet, but certainly guidance to um, um, minimise corruption, um, use of child labour, etc. In that in that sector, I think that will become more evident or more apparent in the data centre industry as well. And and um, the the sort of back end, the infrastructure back end, will become more transparent. So if um, IT um, or data centre operators, whoever, if they want to um, clean up their own acts and uh, have access to the right sort of in, uh, information to ensure that they can choose companies that are um, ethical, sustainable, etc. So it's, it's, uh, this is um, because the industry is comparatively new, mm. um, as yet we haven't got um, the sort of processes and procedures and, and so forth in place, but that is definitely under development and before too long it will be in the public domain. I, I think that's right, the, the point of that transparency is, is really important mm. and, um, and I think just increasing awareness because, yeah. you know, we talk about people becoming so dependent on their smartphones now and, yeah. you know, children are using Facebook or, or whatever it is without really thinking about yeah. You know, the, the impact of that environmental or otherwise. So at the moment these these are things that we just take for granted. They're they're, they're almost unlimited yeah. resources for us which, which we use without thinking about you know what, what really goes on. But um the, the more they become part of our lives, I think, yeah. I think people are gonna become more aware about what, what is the what is the impact, what's the what's the cost of the, the internet and all of these services. And I think that there are a lot of myths that are uh, in the public domain well, and the professional domain as well, about, oh, I'm not going to print that because uh, if I use, um, you know, digital information, it has no impact. That is nonsense. And somehow we have to, you know, uh, make sure that people are pro properly educated and aware of the impact of um, digital technology and data exchange, et cetera. But um, I think I'm optimistic, really. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm optimistic. I think that there is enough, um, there's a growing will to, um, make the whole data centre industry more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a sort of groundswell from Green Grid and smaller, or more local organisations like Green IT Amsterdam, for example. So I'm optimistic that we can make changes. Mm -hmm. And I think just looking at you know the way that things were designed and operated ten years ago, yeah. you know, it's, the, the industry's come a long way in, in a short space yeah. of time. Yeah. Really, it's very dynamic. It's, it's innovative. It's technology-led. So yeah. I think now we're just really starting to focus on well, what are the other areas for, for improvement? So you know, who knows where we'll be in another ten years' time? Yeah. Yeah. But from a from a life cycle assessment point of view, I think some of the challenges that we've had in in the research is is access to data and mm. and and seeing what studies are out there, how much manufacturers are willing to share yeah. about their own products as well. That, that's yeah. That's um. It, that's a real challenge, um, but uh, there's just a, a statistic that um, certainly took my breath away when I first saw it. Um, we think about um, digital technology, you know, saving the world. Um, it might, it might not. Um, one of the big sort of embodied factors is um, the, the um, all electronics equipment and chips, in particular. Um, they require a lot of energy to produce them. So although they are incredibly small and light, and we find them absolutely ev everywhere, whether it's washing machines or central heating boilers, cars, TVs, whatever, um, the 
there's a, somebody did some research, and forgive me if I can't remember the reference, but um, on a, a sort of weight for weight um, basis, in order to produce a car, and it could be um, you're looking at one gram of car, a kilo of car, whatever, it doesn't matter, the ratio of fossil fuels required to produce the car is one to two. So for every gram of car or kilo of car that is produced, you require two either grams or kilos of fossil fuel. When you're looking at um, electronic equipment, the ratio is dramatically different. In order to produce one gram of electronics and, and chips in particular, it requires 630 grams of fossil fuel. So that's a totally, totally different ratio. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is something, there are a large number of cars in the world, but there are many millions of times more chips. So, um, yeah, we've got to really to the start, start thinking about what happens to electronic equipment at end of life um, and stop wasting the um, embodied fuels, etc., and resources that uh, um, have been used to produce the electronic equipment in the first place. Mm. And if we do that, then um, it may be that um, actually it becomes more environmentally efficient not to print things than to print them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I mean, I, I think we're we're kind of coming to the end of the hour now, so I think um, we're probably okay. we ready to close the. Yep. Just yeah. one more thing. Um, Roll is on the line. He's going to answer the question about the Green Grid and their own uh, okay. approach to this issue. So I'll just hand over to him for a second. Okay. Yes. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, so let me see. So the question was about uh, uh, what's happening with stuff and. Uh, uh, and with uh, the DCMM, yeah? so uh, I'm not sure where it came from, but uh, well, there's no simple answer to it. Well, first of all, Christoph, uh, he, he uh, had trouble with his health last year, so that's why things didn't move along as smoothly as everybody wanted it. And then understanding from his point of view, he didn't want to give it up. Uh, and then he said, like, okay, just give me a little bit of time until I'm recovered, and then I'll, I'll, I can pick it up again. Uh, but so everybody was hopeful, hopeful that he would pick it up again, but his health did not allow it to pick it up again. So, um, for somebody who was, was proposing to do some work in it, so that would be welcome. But just be aware that Christophe Garnier is, is out of the picture because of his, uh, his health issues. Uh, and if somebody is willing to, to take over, uh, to take over the plane from him, then uh, I would suggest that. Uh, Best way is, is to send me an email or give me a call, and, and we can discuss how it would work and what actually needs to be done. And if somebody wants to volunteer or team wants to volunteer to pick on up where uh, Christoph left off. So that, that's what I can say. I'm not sure if we can discuss it on this call, but uh, please, please let me know if uh, there's willingness to take it on. Just be aware that Christoph is not in the lead anymore. Hello? Hello, yes. I think that is everything. Okay. Okay, well, um, thank you for asking us to present again, and um, I, I hope everyone found it an informative discussion. Thank you. And to clarify to everybody, we have recorded this and we will send around a recording of the roundtable. Yeah, and Thanks maybe so just uh, so, I'm sorry to, before we go, just, just uh, some more news from Lance on the DCM, so the data center maturity model. So apparently uh, it has been made publicly available uh, and it's integrated in EM5600. So that's something from Lance. Thank you for that, Lance. And Marc-André, please, yes, please get in touch with me if you wish. All right. Okay. That was it. Thank you very much. Thank you for attending. Thank you.